September 25th, 2012. Cops follow a tip. The man they're after is inside an apartment building. Officer Ali Perez takes the lead. I was in charge of investigating a case where the woman discovered that her two daughters were being uh, molested by her live-in boyfriend. As they approach, the suspect, Daniel Witzak, is waiting, armed with a high-powered rifle. He won't come to the door. Sheriff's office, open up! I mule kick the door. The door goes flying open, and I take one step, and he opens fire. The first round hits me in the left arm, right here, right in the middle of my arm. Officer Perez and his partner return fire. The suspect is wounded but keeps shooting. Perez can't find cover. He takes more hits before he and the shooter empty their clips. It's a race to reload. I was having a very hard time coming to terms with the fact that this is where I was going to meet my end, that I was going to die right here, and I knew it, and there was nothing I could do to change it. And I expect a bullet to the head any moment. And that's when the miracle happens. Our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, was there. I didn't see him up here, but he was in between us. He was already there when I raised my eyes. And it was magnificent. I knew one or two things was going to happen. Either one, I'm going home to the Lord, or two, I'm going home to Gracie and the kids, and either one is a win. And I said, Lord, I trust you completely. What do you want me to do with this guy? And I watched him. He picked up the feather that was in the ink bottle, and he wrote. And then he put the feather back in the ink bottle. And this note, it was the size of a three by five index card. It flies off the desk like a leaf in the wind. And I watched it with my eyes. I tracked it with my eyes. And then I came down here and it landed right here on my vest. I pick it up and I read it. And it says, I want you to bless him. Now, this, keep in mind, this is a guy that just ripped my arm almost completely off, shot a hole through my body, shot the supervisor, horribly molested these two little girls. Jesus didn't say reload and finish the job. He said, I want you to bless him. So I looked right at the, looked right at the bad guy and said, God bless you, brother. Officer Perez sees more visions before noticing Witzak staring at him. Looks at me and he asked me, would you like to crawl out to your friends now? Real, real, almost, his, man, his mannerisms changed. Now up to this point, I don't know if he sees Jesus or not. I, I have no idea, I don't know. So I said, yes. I said, yeah, I'm ready to go. Witzak helps Perez towards the front door. By now, a backup team has arrived and they start firing. Witzak retreats. Perez is left alone. And then the door opens on its own. I'm in no condition to open doors and turn handles and do all this stuff. Bad guy never made it to the door. Rescue teams at the bottom of the stairs, they never made it to the door. How did the door get opened? God open that door. Officer Perez crawls to the doorway and a member of the rescue team carries him to safety. Witzak eventually surrenders and is taken into custody, while Perez is taken to the ER to fight for his life. Doctors tell his family he has no chance of survival. Everybody dropped on their knees right there and started praying, and not just at the hospital, but at the Santee station and at stations all across the county. Everybody got on their knees and prayed because the word went out like fire. And I'm alive because of the power of prayer. After 27 surgeries and hours of grueling physical therapy, Officer Perez testifies at Witzak's trial. He takes the opportunity to extend grace to the man who tried to kill him. Daniel Witzak is currently serving a life sentence. Ali Perez is medically retired and continues to recover. But he says he's gained far more than he's lost. I got to spend three minutes with Jesus before my day of judgment. And if I got some cuts and bruises along the way and I lose the use of my arm, it was worth it. Every heartbeat and every breath is a gift from God. Oh, I am so, so thankful. I am thankful to be here. I'm thankful for the opportunity to testify to people that he is true, that God is real, that Jesus loves us so very, very, very much. And there's an opportunity that we got to before it's too late, get on our knees, humble ourselves before him and get right with the Lord. Success does many things to people. To me, it brought about not only accomplishments, but it brought about pride. Every home Alan Youngblood built, he built well. I would look at myself and 
think that these accomplishments were absolutely all mine. Never even imagined that possibly in the background there could have been a God who was directing my life. Allen ran a successful business constructing multi-million dollar commercial buildings and luxury mansions. And everyone knew not to cross Alan Youngblood. I became a person of anger, explosive, almost to the point of danger sometimes. Anger became the thing that ruled my life in so many ways. It gave me power. It gave me position. And even though Alan went to church, his beliefs kept him far from God. The way I saw God was that he was a God that knew everything that I did and saw every sin that I ever committed and possibly writing them down in a book in heaven. I found it impossible to love a God who was out to get you. Then one night on New Year's Eve, Alan went to church. As he stood at the communion rail, he says his soul was transported to another place where he heard a voice that sounded like rushing waters. The scripture came to me and it says, if you say you love God and you hate your brother, you are no more than a liar and a murderer. At that moment, he repented of his sins and experienced the forgiveness of God, something he had never really felt before. Alan was then carried away to a beautiful city with a gate made of pearl. But when I walked through those gates, my mind could not even conceive what I would see. Have we read about the streets of Go? Yes, but they were different. They were suspended like a body highway with no visible means of suspension. As I neared that area, I saw cascading out of the throne of God, a massive waterfall from which I believe flows the river of life. Then Alan says he saw a friend named Jerry. Jerry had died years earlier in a fiery plane crash, but here in his vision, Jerry appeared normal wearing a blue suit. He turned and he held his hand and pointed toward the top of the platform of the throne of God. I thought, oh, am I gonna see God? A few moments later, Alan says he was standing as he had been at the front of the church. Alan's wife, Barbara, remembers what happened. I didn't know what he was doing. <laughs> it was, you know, trouble me. I thought, oh my goodness, this is embarrassing. He's, he's uh, gone to sleep. I said, honey, I did not go to sleep. And I can't tell you what happened to me until some other time. For days after his heavenly encounter, Alan continued to be affected by what he remembered. His whole attitude was one of softness, the hard uh, look that he had was gone. Alan began to speak publicly about his experience in heaven. At one meeting, he saw the widow of his friend Jerry, the man in the blue suit that he had seen in heaven. As Alan described the scene, Jerry's widow spoke up. She revealed she had given the blue suit to the funeral director to put into the coffin, even though her husband's body had been so badly burned. That suit was the same suit Alan says he saw Jerry wearing in heaven. That's when Alan realized why he had seen his friend in heaven. To go back home, to tell one woman, there is a God, there is a heaven, there's life after death, and Jerry's there. Alan continues to tell others that heaven is real in a new book called Voice of Many Waters. God's greatest desire is, is that you know who he is and how he is and how much he loves you. It's impossible not to fall in love with him when you really begin to have that relationship, the greatest relationship you will ever know. In September 1996, Hurricane Fran slammed into the Carolinas. In the storm's aftermath, Georgia power worker Rick Moncrief was assigned to clear downed power lines in North Carolina. He was on a rooftop trying to pull a line from under a fallen tree when the line snapped. He fell backwards and landed head first on the concrete driveway. He was flown to Duke Medical Center. His wife Donna was told to prepare for her husband's funeral.
And I felt a lot of fear and I felt concerned. And I, I, I had this every scenario going through my brain. How am I going to raise three daughters by myself? Um, I'm too young to be a widow. You name it, those kind of thoughts came through my head. Rick had several broken ribs and his brain was hemorrhaging. Ten minutes after he arrived at the hospital, he slipped into a coma. He was hooked up to a breathing machine and all kinds of machines. And so I just, I don't, I, I just looked at him, you know, I was like, I, I was in shock, I think. I couldn't believe that he was laying there. And the doctors were just saying that it was a wait and see game. They didn't know. I believed in prayer and I knew that Jesus was the healer. In my own strength right at that moment, I didn't have that, that strength in myself to pray. And so I had believers and friends who were praying for me as well as for Rick, that we would, you know, that we would be able to come through this. The prayers continued, and by day five, Rick was still unresponsive. At least it appeared that way. I was taken into the throne room of God. It was more real than you are. It was so real, and everything was just so white, whiter than white. And I, I was on my belly, on my face before the Lord, and I saw his feet. I didn't see his face, but he asked me, what do you want to do? And I kept hearing the scripture over and over, whose report will you believe? Will you believe the report of the Lord or the believe the report of the doctors? And I said, I want to live. I want to live and declare the word of the Lord. And he stood up and he clapped his hands and he said, that's enough. And when he said, that's enough, I began immediately to come out of the coma. His doctor said Rick would never be the same again. Rick and Donna believed differently. She said, well, you're the most luckiest person in the world now that you ever came out of this coma. And you recovered from this fall a little bit, but it'll be 60 months minimum, which is five years, before you will ever be 40% back. And I told her, I said, no, ma'am. I said, I don't mean any disrespect at all to you. But I said, it's not going to take that long. The Lord's going to do a quick work. During rehab, Rick says he read Psalms in the Bible, and he and Donna joined their friends and family in prayer. I was believing for the healing, and my friends were believing for the healing, because we believe by his stripes we are healed. Each day, his health improved, and after just 27 days of rehab, Rick had a 95% recovery. When I came back to work at the power company in the early part of 1997, I came back to work full duty. The faithfulness of God comes to my mind. That our God, at the at the immediate cry of our heart, will hear us, and He listens, and He's faithful. The great doctors at, at these two great hospitals did all they could do, but it was the Father's love. It was His grace. It was His compassion on me to allow me to live today and, and live these 18 years since this has happened. Rick later retired from the power company and became a pastor. He cherishes every moment he has with his wife and family and says he doesn't let a day go by without giving thanks to God for his miraculous healing. Every day is an incredible day. Every day is just, there's always a lot to be thankful for. I'm just thankful that I feel better today than I did yesterday. I'm thankful today that I'm able to stand up I'm thankful today I don't have a, a massive headache this morning. I'm thankful today that I'm able to breathe by myself without a machine. I'm just thankful.